how can we explain all of these different kinds of experiences unless we start to understand that all of the clinical and experimental evidence clearly documents that these experiences are biological in nature. They are experiences which are at least linked to an area in our brain called our right temporal lobe. Now I want to emphasize I'm being philosophically neutral <laughs> in making that statement. I am not commenting on the objective reality uh, uh, that you know uh, is being described. I'm only saying that we cannot treat these experiences alone in isolation. We can't say the after death is a grief induced hallucination and the premonition of death is just some kind of weird thing that science doesn't even want to deal with and the shared dying experiences well, maybe some sort of cultural embellishment uh, by uh, patients who are acting out in grief and, and responding to too many Oprah Winfrey shows. Uh, you know, that uh, is not a theory which explains the evidence. One theory which does explain the evidence is the understanding that we have in our brains the biological ability to perceive another reality. Well documented both in experimental evidence and clinical evidence. And that area is our right temporal lobe. Arnold Mandel, the great neurobiologist, said it the best when he said the kingdom of heaven can be found in our right temporal lobes. What is the basic nature of that experience? That remains elusive for researchers into the brain as much as it does for physicists. Dr. Morris emphasizes that while science can put forward physical explanations for certain extraordinary occurrences, that doesn't explain why we're wired that way or their ultimate meaning. So perhaps we should also look toward the social sciences for some answers, especially now that Western researchers have finally begun to study seriously the approaches to life and death of other cultures and other times. If we look at the history of civilization, people who were nomadic people or who lived in tribal situations oftentimes used their power of extrasensory perception much more than we do today. When we need to get, to get in touch with someone, we pick up a telephone and we call them. That was not true back in the beginning of time. If the men went out on a hunt, generally the women would have the water ready and prepared. They would know if they had um, killed an animal to bring back for the food for the family. We don't have to do that today. We send somebody to the grocery store with a shopping list. So we don't have to use our power. I've always been fascinated by the West African tradition and also the traditions, ancient traditions of India, particularly uh, Dravidian India, about the transformation of consciousness. The network of that culture, of both of those cultures, is that the nature of life is transformation. And Einstein, um, in the modern age, rediscovered that. He gave it a mathematical formulation. But the idea is as old as our conceptualization of time itself, that nothing is created or destroyed, but endlessly transformed. E equals mc squared is really true. In some cultures, um, the dreams of the dying are taken very deeply and very seriously. They are not ignored. In the United States and certain parts of Western Europe, unfortunately, when a person is anticipating their own death, very often because we live in a materially dominated uh, civilization, we don't know what to say uh, because we tacitly, unfortunately, assume that uh, the end of physical uh, life is the end of psychic life. We often uh, are left with saying, um, trying to be comforting to the person, or um, uh, preparing the person in some other way, or drugging them up. Other civilizations sometimes will meet this with a great sense of joy and relief. Ah, my travail in this life is over. I can turn my attention to elsewhere. I, I don't have to be as involved with other things. Let me turn my attention to the process of dying, because there is a way to die. Death is not the enemy, and there is a way to die. There's a certain sequence, a certain pattern that occurs in, in, in the uh, dying process. Bardal Prodal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, there are different sequences or stages during the dying process of what happens to consciousness as it leaves the physical body. 
and one prepares for it, one studies for it. You don't want to you want to sleep through your own death. And an even older text, the uh, the uh, Book of Ani, uh, Papyrus of Ani, uh, often called the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or its original name actually is the, the Book of the Coming Forth by Day and the Going Forth by Night. It is about how to die, how to focus one's attention, how to let go of physical entanglements, how to resolve emotional entanglements so that one's attention is turned to the deep regions of one's own psyche to put oneself together, to focus one's attention so that one, one is no longer as intensely embodied the energy is not dissipated. One can focus and one can stay clear. You don't want to sleep through your own death because it potentially is an extraordinary luminous process. We're now going to hear from a scientist operating at what many people would consider the far edge of research. Dr. Stan Groff is a psychiatrist who works with altered states of consciousness. I had myself uh, training as, as a psychiatrist, as a physician, and then uh, as a Freudian analyst. And when I became interested in non-ordinary states and started observing powerful mystical experiences and also having some myself, uh, of course, the first idea is that it has to be wired somehow in the hardwired in the brain, and spent quite a, quite a bit of time trying to figure out how something like that is possible. And today, I came to the conclusion that uh, it is not coming from the brain. Uh, in that sense, it supports what Aldous Huxley believed after he had some powerful psychedelic experiences and then was trying to link them. Uh, to the brain, he came to the conclusion that uh, maybe the brain functions as a kind of reducing valve that actually protects us against uh, too much uh, cosmic input. Uh, so I don't see, for, for example, that uh, something like experiences of archetypal realms, heavens, paradises, uh, experiences of uh, archetypal beings such as uh, deities, demons from different cultures, that people typically have in these states that uh, they could be somehow explained as something that's coming from the uh, repositories of the brain. I don't think you can, you can locate the source of consciousness. I'm, I'm quite sure that it's, it is not in the brain. It is not inside of the skull. skull. It actually, uh, according to my experience, would lie beyond time and space. So it's not, it's not localizable. You actually come to the source of consciousness when you dissolve any, any categories uh, that imply separation, individuality, uh, time, uh, space, and so on, you just experience it as, uh, as a presence. Uh, you know, people who had this experience can either perceive that source or they can actually become the source, get completely dissolved and, and experience that source. Uh, but such categories as time and space, localization, coordinates are, uh, are not uh, relevant for that experience. You actually have a sense that the concepts of time and space come from that place. They are generated by that place, but, but the source, the cosmic source itself, the cosmic consciousness cannot be, cannot be located, uh, certainly not in the material world. And if it is not in the material world, where does this cosmic consciousness reside? We still don't know. But one thing is for certain, the new story of science, and especially neurobiology and quantum physics, has destroyed the old arguments of the materialists and the positivists against the possibility of life after death. We now know that the mind is more than the brain. Our bodies are a dance of energy. A whole world of new possibilities has been revealed.